Okay, we'll uh, slowly begin the question and answer discussion session. So, um, first maybe we could um, just ask um, if there are points of clarification and, and questions and then this will also lead to the discussion uh, that we will have. So maybe if you want, I mean those at the back, if you prefer to come to the front, it might ease the um, mic uh, process. Um, but if not, of course you can hide at the back. <laughs> so questions, comments, thoughts? Hey, thanks. So that was uh, very interesting, really useful to have uh, such an appreciative uh, and uh, critical, thoughtful uh, uh, comment on, on Ostrom and her work and the transformative possibilities of it. One of the thoughts I had, so, so you mentioned the, the connection with Rojava, and, and we had this very stimulating presentation earlier this week by uh, folks from Rojava. Um, but it, one of the things that it seemed to me was still unsettled from that talk was the uh, ecological and economic aspects of it. So as an example of the commons or eco-socialism, uh, that's a bit unclear to me as a connection, particularly because they're still dependent and, and for reasons that are you know very understandable on exploiting non-renewable resources, particularly oil. Um, and so uh, I don't I don't quite see the connection there, uh, and I'm not sure. Uh, maybe maybe there's something I'm missing. So yeah. Uh, thank you, Derek. That was a wonderful talk. Um, just two quick questions. One that uh, do you see the Ostrom's rules for governing the commons being applicable to other property forms? And the second question is more of a comment, really, that um, one of the things that I think is often missing in, the, in their work is an appreciation of the intensity of desperation. That you might have the best rules in the world, but if people are literally surviving from day to day and have to just you know, cut the ground from under their feet, they don't have the luxury of thinking about the next generation, let alone the seventh one. When people plant fast-growing trees because they give rewards, returns immediately, rather than say on this campus where trees have been planted by people who have the luxury of thinking about the future. So um, to the extent that local communities with the you know, best intentions and will in the world can't actually escape certain situations which make them think in short terms, which, are, you know, which have adverse effects on the commons, takes us right back to, I think, what Pat was saying, that we have to think of the larger structures of structural conditions, the state, the market, within which the commons are embedded. So uh, if you can just talk a little bit more about how the Ostroms uh, confronted that question, because I'm sure it came up lots of times um, in, in critiques of their work. Uh, thank you to both of you. It was a very interesting uh, discussion. So I have uh, two questions. One has to do, I will do a short comment if possible. Okay. Um, one has to do with the question of the state. Because uh, especially Derek, you mentioned, uh, and the, it's obvious in the Commons work and also Ostrom's, uh, this beyond market and state. But I'm wondering that uh, during the, the capitalist crisis and during this specific crisis, I have the feeling that we have a, a phase of empowerment of the state. The, the state is still very powerful. And uh, we can see that, for example, uh, with the way that is dealing with the debt crisis within Europe. So uh, I'm wondering how, let's say, the commons approach and the eco-social approach deals with this question, with the critique to the state, not only uh, uh, with the new power of the state. And the second question related to the first one, um, Stavros, uh, last Tuesday, that he also talked uh, a bit about commons, he said something that uh, what is important about the commons is not only uh, the social ownership that uh, Pat uh, mentioned, but also um, a social ownership of power if I can use this uh, frame, this framework. Uh, and this is, 
sometimes we feel, uh, I, f I have the feeling that we're talking about what, we're trying to answer the what questions, and, some, and we forget the how question. And this is my, my question, actually. How we're going to have uh, a social responsibility, or let's say a social ownership of power, and how the common structure or the common framework deals with this question of, uh, of power. A round of answers or comments back, Derek. Okay, I'm trying to remember all this. Um, starting off with Rajava, um, I think with kind of the Ostrom's work, if you're thinking how does this fit in with the history of political philosophy, that probably in some ways never works. And though there are problems with what how they approached power, one of the things which is good about how they approached power was they wouldn't talk about general debates. They talk about things which are very specific. And I think there's a problem with us as academics um, coming up with theory, debating alternatives. But what's the point at which this actually engages with things which are on the ground? So in terms of my political practice in the Green Party, which is slightly separate from my kind of Austrian practice, as international coordinator of the Green Party, I'm trying to think, what are the most important things going on in terms of green politics? How can we support them as effectively as possible? And I think this is why Rajava is very, very important. And I, I stood as an election candidate in the British election in Windsor, where the Queen lives, got 3% of the vote. Um, and I was sponsored by um, the People's Democratic Union, who are the main political party in Rojava. Um, you know, and I've had this kind of connection in the Green Party. We sent out an election observer um, to the election a couple of weeks ago, who was involved, who witnessed the bomb attack, and was, you know, Sean, who's our election observer, was unhurt but saw people killed. And I, I think one of the things I do get in terms of politics and the Ostroms is what's the specific thing you're going to do in a particular precise context. And I think what's exciting with Rojava is what you've had with the Kurds and their allies um, is people saying we were nationalists, now we believe in self-government. Um, we were Marxist-Leninist, now we're adopting the ideas of the, the green anarchist uh, Murray Bookchin. Um, so on paper, it's kind of ecology, feminism, self-government, secularism, um, and the practice of that, of course, is going to be very, very difficult, reflects, of course, in some ways, the situation with oil, with the Latin American left, that you have people who proclaim eco-socialism, but their economies um, are based on oil, so we can sort of shout hypocrisy, but what I would shout is... Um, David Cameron and George Osborne in my country who want more and more oil and more and more fracking and more and more destruction. So the practices obviously won't live up to ecotopia, but the very fact that you've got a situation where people want to introduce self-government, want to wrestle with problems of conflict and how you deal with diverse communities, um, who at least aspire to be ecological, that is the core of what the Ostroms were talking about. And these kind of problems of self-governance, and the, you've got a society where there's been conflicts and sectarianism, and that conflict is going on, and people have been very repressed, and how you actually create self-governing democratic solutions is absolutely at the heart of the Ostrom's work. So that's why it's important. you know. And what I would say is they were coming out of the tradition of kind of city-states, radical republicanism, looking at how that influenced the American Revolution and, and so on. Now, I think I've forgotten most of the other questions, but what clearly came out with the question about um, people have to act in the short term, um, people may be very desperate, they can't think about the next seven generations. I think this reflects both weaknesses and strengths in what the Ostroms were doing. Um, so what they didn't have was an understanding of class, and macrostructures and so on, you know, because their references were coming from Austrians, they were practicing the stuff in the Cold War, they were from a generation 
The previous generation were people like Buchanan, who were disillusioned, Frank Knight, people who were disillusioned Marxists, who then became Austrians. So, you know, anything where you're talking about capitalism, class Marxism, those structures, there's obvious reasons why they wouldn't be theorising at that level. And unless we theorise at that level, there are problems, because we're not, you know, individually free to get together and do these things. We're within particular structures. I think the closest they came to it was saying... Um, if people have a commons, they then have a material interest in maintaining the commons, because if they don't maintain the commons, they're then in poverty. So that was what they would emphasise. Um, and But the nearest, really, they got to kind of conceptualising capitalism was to say, oh, you might have a roving bandit economy. And this would be the idea that, um, you know, fishing fleet from Japan or wherever would come in, and that way they just suck up all the fish and destroy the commons. So what's good about their politics is it's like this very local, institutional, maybe problems with the local, but very specific, so in what you do in that situation. And in any situation, you have to think about rules. But they maybe fail to, to look at the macro, um, and I think we can critique them, but equally, no thinker does everything. Um, in terms of... Um, the financial crisis and the states and all of these kind of things, you know, the, the, the state and the market are not kind of separate entities. They work together. The state sets up institutional rules that um, support the market. Um, neoliberal economics, um, you know, failed utterly. And people talked about zombie economics. But rather than having the empowerment, what we've had is more neoliberal economics because what the neoliberals do is use the crisis to entrench their power. So in Britain, we've got the least resilient economy in Europe based on banking, um, and that puts it at great risk. But the crisis has increased government debt, so then that's used as an excuse to marketise more and corporatise and so on and so forth. And we have to look at ways to intervene, which I think are, are very, very difficult in the UK, but certainly what we've seen, and again, probably difficult everywhere, but what you have in Turkey is the HDP, Syriza in Greece, parties in Spain, to some extent all the interesting things that are happening in Scotland. So you have some potential for change, but one of the elements of that is to look in a very nitty-gritty way at how institutions work. So I think one way we can scale up the Austrian... Yes, it was the application of the design rules. Um, so kind of yes and no. So there were... I think eight design rules that make a good common, so it's like boundaries and graduated sanctions and so on. Um, I don't think you can just take those and then use them to say how other institutions would work. I think what Austrian was very much about doing was do case studies, see what works, see what fails, and then apply ever more sophisticated and empirical and methodological approaches. So one of the things she was interested in was workers' co-ops, so an Ostrom approach would be to say, sometimes co-ops work, sometimes they don't work, and there are, in, there are wider structural things that might affect this, but just within the interactions of people in the, in the cooperatives. So what you would you do if you have like workers' control of factories, like Gramsci would talk about, is you'd say, what are the examples of this? Where's it worked best? Where's it failed? And then you generate rules from that. So what you need is the micro and the macro. So you need to be, have this like structural critique of capitalism, and you need, in a sense, the kind of Leninist moment of how we change it. But if you're trying to change it, once you've kind of got the Rojava situation, and you've had the revolution, how do you actually run institutions which are people-centered and ecological? And that's where I think her work comes in. I hope that's answered some of the questions. Just one, one point on the social ownership of power. Um, it does seem to me that, uh, in a sense, two things, or well, three things matter. One is um, the people who make the decisions in, in relation to the use of power have to include all those who are going to be affected by it. Secondly, they need to be able to participate in a way that is meaningful so that they actually understand what the issues are. Um, and... Uh, lastly, that the 
absence of real power, so let's say participation in the form of consultation, which then makes no difference, is disempowering uh, and in fact creates apathy and uh, um, disillusionment. And one of the reasons why in many uh, countries with parliamentary democracies the participation rate in voting is falling uh, is because people feel, well, it doesn't seem to make any difference at the moment. What's the point? So it's got to, it's got to I think, have all three of those. People have got to participate. They've got to be able to participate effectively, and it's got to make a difference. Um, well, this will be an easy question, because it will immediately follow what you last said being able to participate. So maybe we can have a discuss what makes people able to participate. Maybe uh, economic justice, it obviously empowers people and then makes them able to participate. But also this is something that I learned from uh, Michael Albert, actually, I'm a good follower and a friend of Michael Albert, and it's his participatory economics. And other aspect that makes people able to participate is the way we distribute work. There are work that empowers us, and also there are works which perishes people. And then, in like in some corps, and or in some social arrangements though people depart with very good intentions for uh, participatory democracy, participatory decision-making, because that distribution of work is not changed, like those who do empowering works do keep on doing their empowering works, and those who are suffering under uh, perishing works keep on doing what they do, they are not able to participate, they are not able to access information and then hold the situation sort of firebacks or the experience becomes, uh, experience fails. So maybe we can a bit elaborate on this. Thanks for the debate. Uh, I think I'm, oh, all my studies and practices are uh, related to both your your talk in terms of uh, theoretical background and, and also of activism, I would say. And so I have a lot of uh, possible questions, but I want to focus on some of them. Um, f the first one is uh, to Derek Wall. Perhaps uh, you can address more if uh, because this debate about uh, eco-socialism, I think, was a very was pioneered by by Gortz in the 70s back, and there were um, a bunch of people, very relevant people, like also Manschot, who was uh, president of the Commission, the European Commission, at that time, that participated in the discussion of uh, political ecology in the 70s, and they were. No, what's the, I mean, there, there's a debate that then was published in the in a French uh, uh, Nouvelle Observateur that was a um, discussion between Gortz, Sikoman, uh, Scholt, and other relevant uh, people uh, in that moment in the institution of Europe that were discussing about uh, eco-socialism. I mean, Gortz is very relevant in... Uh, also in the discussion about self-governing and so on and so far. And in, the, in that moment uh, uh, was very critical also the discussion about the idea of uh, limits growth for Europe and so on and so far. So I'm, uh, my question is that if you know, uh, if that inside the Green Party internationally there is a discussion about why they failed, why they uh, will not uh, be able to become hegemonic, at least, let's say, in leftist party. I don't, I don't say in the society as a whole. Because at that moment, for example, in Italy, we had also uh, Enrico Berlinguer, that has been the secretary of the biggest part, communist party ever in, in Europe, that exactly was challenging the idea of austerity, uh, trying to 
develop a different kind of austerity discourses uh, that communists should uh, embrace uh, because of uh, uh, the clear uh, emerging uh, of uh, news from the third world and the poverty and the inequality uh, among nations. And so, I mean, there were in Europe an emerging uh, discussion about uh, eco-communism uh, and democratic communism, of course, but they failed. So are you reflecting on that? And th this is very clear for us. For example, we are now probably next uh, spring, we will have in, uh, um, in Sweden a debate about that, why they failed. And if you are not reflecting, if you want to participate in that, would be useful also not to understand why it didn't emerge and didn't uh, become uh, hegemonic, at least in Communist Party and Socialist Party and Green Party, because also there were uh, then the Green Party in Germany that was really keen on this kind of argumentation, very radical, contesting the idea of growth as the solution, you know, trying to develop you know, self-reliance -reli society and so on and so forth. So I think this is very important. Uh, then on th um, in terms of political debate, then on, on theoretical level, I think w w what uh, what I, I will add another critiques to to look at the importance that is for us um, the Ostrom work is the fact that uh, basically uh, she was intervening in a debate that uh, became analytically relevant in 1950s with Samuelson work about the public good. So Samuelson developed the analytics that then was used by Ostrom, like the analytics, the marginal cost was zero for public goods and so on and so far. And the debate in USA between economists was very normative. Even if they developed a, an analytic tool, it was very normative because the debate was around where the state can intervene and Samuelson would uh, stay with the let's say, an uh, enlarged uh, intervention of public states. Indeed, one of his first paper about that was uh, uh, the space of the state in the economy. So, I mean, this was a, a clear normative debate between the people that want to expand market intervention uh, and the people that in, a, in economic uh, discipline want to an intervention of the state. And in this, they developed the analytics, the marginal cost equal zero and so on and so far, but they were defeated. And Ostrom entered in this analytics, but taking this normativity as the central part. So um, one of these critiques that we have to unpack the normativity that is beyond the analytics of a very good uh, institutional analysis that then Ostrom developed, because otherwise we cannot really understand what was the public debate, the political debate on that. The White House yeah. Also, and then on on um, uh, um, to you just to because you closed with this idea of uh, Gramsci um, and the importance now to to um, try to occupy and um, also um, space and discourses that are a different level. Uh, but how you how you are um, looking at these possibilities? Because for for example, for me, uh, the practices are really important. Not because they will be adding uh, one to another to scaling up. Because at one point, if you are really hegemonic, you jump at a certain level. So it's not a matter of you know different practices that we sum up and so on and so far. Exactly, for example, we make the example of the hegemony, you know, the, the ability to take the power without make any revolution for the bourgeoisie in Italy was exactly that one. They were able, through their economic practices and social activities, to convince the Italian society that uh, they were building the best society ever. And they're scaling up, taking the state also. But it was not, uh, you know, uh, a necessity uh, automatic necessity to take it, no? And this is what, for example, for me happened nowadays in, in Barcelona in some way. There are a lot of practices of commoning that in some way at, at, 
um, a point in the last election, uh, they decide to, to, to also to engage with the political, um, at, at the municipal level, with the political uh, struggle, right? So I don't think that uh, we should dismiss the practices uh, as it, because the practices exactly create a different kind of common sense that then can be used to jump at different level with different properties. Yes, uh, thank you, Derek and, and Pat, uh, for being here and for sharing your thoughts on, on Ostrom and eco-socialism. I, I was really happy uh, uh, to, to have this perspective because I, I've always, uh, as a student of Ostrom, was, was interested in, in the radicalizing potential of her work rather than, than, than the bashing or the uh, um, worshipping, which is kind of the two extremes which we find today. Uh, a lot of her students uh, basically repeat this kind of uh, design principles analysis over and over and over, and it becomes kind of a <coughs> this kind of reproduction of, of knowledge without uh, really questioning the politics of, of this. And then, on the other hand, you have people who say, oh, this is neoliberal. Uh, blah, 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 and then they just discard it, you know. Uh, George Cafentis, for instance, has a, the Capitalist and Anti-Capitalist Commons paper where he says, oh, Ostrom is, anti is capitalist commons, it's not worth it. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> I thought uh, it, it was a very interesting analysis, this critical engagement, but so I was wondering, uh, on one hand, um, have you looked at the, the political impact of, of Ostrom's work? In, in, on the ground. This is a, a, just an empirical question that I've had. Uh, how has Ostrom impacted actual policy and, and political decisions? Um, she, had a, she had a story about how uh, her research in Nepal's irrigation systems was actually uh, uh, central in a debate at the time when the Asian Development Bank was promoting decentralization and the statization of the irrigation communities in Nepal. And basically, they wanted to build these cement channels all over Nepal because they thought this, these old uh, traditional systems were very inefficient, blah, 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 no? And how her research showed that these uh, old irrigation systems were actually quite effective, no? Um, but that's like a very pointed example. I haven't seen a lot of examples of, of her work actually influencing these kind of big political decisions. Um, so, so, and the, the, the other question is, um, I mean, so on that first question, basically it leads us to reconsider the politics, not the political stakes of the commons as a political project, you know, which I think is the failure of, of the Ostrom tradition, not looking really at this. Why haven't the commons really expanded over time? Why have they been really diminished over time, despite showing that they are effective at sustainably managing resources, you know? And then the, the other, the other question is, have you, have you had any engagement with Ostrom scholars from the, from the Ostrom school after your book and your, your articles and what kind of, how have they reacted to your attempts to, to radicalize uh, Ostrom's, uh, Ostrom's work? Because I feel uh, that actually there's a, there's a tendency to actually make it more conservative and to capture Ostrom to the right, you know. Uh, World Bank using Ostrom to kind of, so I mean, it's, it's also a political battle there. So I was wondering what the reaction was there. Uh, yeah, just a couple of points. On um, the um, first question, the uh, h how do you enable people to participate? Um, I mean, I completely agree with uh, Albert and Harnell that work um, and the sort of work people do, as I think I said in my opening remarks, uh, shapes who we are uh, and what we're capable of doing. And um, the way in which um, Albert and Harnell deal with this is that they um, try to construct what they call a balanced job complex um, in which uh, they divide work into um, developmental work and um, boring work. And they argue that uh, everybody should have a, a complex which consists of both types of work 
and um, that would enable people to have experience of different sorts of work. And so instead of being confined to the experience of one type of work, uh, now I agree with that, my own way of formulating that is to, uh, I propose that uh, what we uh, need to do is to abolish the social division of labor, not the functional division of labor, but the social division of labor, so that some people spend all their time, uh, all their working lives running things, managing things. Uh, the rest of us spend all our time being managed, but, but some of us um, actually um, also do uh, intellectual work, which develops certain capabilities. Others do skilled craft work. Uh, others do, uh, some people spend all their lives digging ditches and doing boring work, which is uh, unproductive. And so what we really need to do is to move towards a situation in which the different types of work are shared between people, um, rather than people spending all their lives doing one category of work. Now that doesn't mean to say that there wouldn't be a functional division of labour still. Not everybody can be an expert at everything in each category of, of work, but they can all do the different categories of work. Um, so I think that's a, a, over a lifetime a better way of thinking about it than Albert and Harnell but because they, there's complex problems of different types of work appear in different proportions in different workplaces and so how do you sort it out? But nevertheless we're agreed that the important question is the one you raise that in order to be able to participate you have to have had the experience of what you need in order to be able to make an input into that participation effectively. Um, the only other uh, issue then is, is on um, the question of why did um, the earlier attempts at eco-socialism fail and, um, uh, and the issue of jumps and, 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 and Gramsci. Now, I think that the important thing here is that um, Gramsci argues that people's um, experience in daily life and in the institutions through which we live our daily lives um, shapes the way we think. Um, but he also argues that there are these different, if you like, diverse activities of the sort that have dominated, I think, uh, the workshop. Um, but they can be articulated in different ways, in terms of different theoretical and ideological positions. And so I think that what happened, for example, in the UK uh, in the 1970s was that there was a growing discontent at the paternalistic, top-down um, way in which the state, and particularly the welfare state, operated with people feeling they wanted more control over what happened to them rather than a paternalistic uh, top-down provision. So how was that articulated? Could either have been articulated in terms of, so what we need to do is democratize the state, get people to participate more in the state, be involved in the decisions that affect them within the welfare state. One way of articulating it the other way of articulating it is to say, right, well, let's go marketize more choice. That will enable people to uh, have control over their lives. And that, of course, was part of the neoliberal, part of what gave an impetus to the neoliberal uh, revolution, uh, which got rid of that welfare state Keynesian social democratic sort of settlement that dominated in the uh, post-World War II years. Um, and so I think... Gramsci's insight here is extremely important that, that things happening on the ground won't just themselves result in a movement in one direction or the other. They have to be articulated in terms of particular values, particular uh, ideologies. And um, that, if you like, is what Gramsci called the, the war of position. That argument goes on, that, that struggle goes on all the time. And when it comes to decisive moments, how that pans out, which as it were side wins, <laughs> depends on what's been going on beforehand. So I think that the reason why the, um, 
the earlier attempts failed is because the, if you like, common sense of the age hadn't been worked on to move it in that direction. And then when crises developed, uh, what was it called, the, um, the intensity of desperation, <laughs> uh, the person over here referred to, not at an individual survival level, but a societal level, when the society get, uh, moved into crisis and then something had to change, the, the spade work, if you like, uh, which would have enabled the movement to change it in a progressive, democratizing, radical, democratic direction, hadn't been done. Uh, and what happened was that the uh, think tanks of the Austrians and uh, the, 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 um, uh, the, the market-based orientations had carried the day, and so that created the framework within which neoliberalism was able to uh, capture uh, the new common sense of the age. I'll try and remember things as well as lighthouses and the German Greens. Um, I think on equality, I mean, the Albert and Hanel stuff, I remember getting the book, opening it, thinking, this is going to be fucking brilliant, I'm going to love this, and, like, hating every word of it, to be honest. And I, I just found it very formalistic. It seemed to be, um, we've got a very formal plan, and, um, you know, all this has gone wrong with the state socialism, and we're going to come up with a, a scheme, and there's a great scheme, and how we divide work, and so on. And I just found that it was a level of abstraction and formalism that kind of made me want to run away. Um, and I think if you're dealing with these problems of sharing work and equality and minorities and power, you need a broad structuralist um, you know, comment and can take from Marx and class analysis and you need to look at gender and ethnicity and all of those big macro things and they weren't explicit enough to me in Albert and Hanel's work. And then what you need to do is do the very, very micro Ostrom thing of saying, in this commons, actually people haven't participated. And in this institution, women have been marginalised. And when you try and do something about marginalisation of women, that then leads to another problem. And it, it, you know, I think you need some way of melding a big macro social scientific critique with also looking at institutions on the ground and how they've oppressed and liberated people and a very sensitive way of learning. Um, so one of the things where I think the Ostroms are quite good, though I've not been to the workshop, what I think they were trying to do at the workshop was have this radical democratic practice and participation and so on. And I think any serious way of dealing with this has to be an ongoing practical experiment. Um, interesting, if you look at Ostrom's work, there's a lot around minorities and equality. Um, there's the thing about she was half Jewish and how the children would taunt her about being Jewish and about her consciousness of coming from like a very poor background and being in Beverly Hill School. And then all of her very, very difficult um, experience as a woman academic being... So the classic thing, this is the woman who's won the Nobel Prize for economics. Um, she wasn't allowed to do a PhD in economics because she was deemed not to have enough maths. The reason why she didn't have the maths was when she was at high school, it was, you don't need maths. Um, so what's kind of interesting is there's so much of her own personal experience around that kind of stuff. So, you know, I think we've got to kind of deal with these things, but there's a danger of, like, having a formalistic, overarching approach to it. Um, and also, I think we need to open up economic activity because economic activity isn't just the commodity form. You know, and that's one of the things with Commons and Wikipedia and so on and so forth. And, you know, a good way of thinking about this is if you think of production of encyclopedias, you could sell the Encyclopedia Britannica or you could have the state coming up with a committee to write encyclopedias. But what about Wikipedia? So there is this kind of strange thing that you've got stuff very rooted in Austrian traditions that, you know, is kind of very communist in terms of practice, but it's stuff that evolves. It's not like somebody necessarily designing it, although, again, the Ostroms weren't radically anti-planning and anti-design. They just felt that you needed to have some flexibility with it. Eco-socialism, um, I think in some ways it's difficult to comment. I mean, this is obviously what I'm obsessed with politically, having been an eco-socialist for 
decades, how do we intervene and build eco-socialism? But one of the other things I think we get from the Ostroms is there's always a danger of, like Wittgenstein said, causes of superstitions, that we think it's narrative X, but unless we've looked at it in some detail, it may be narrative Y. Um, certainly, as I said before, that the whole kind of eco-socialist tradition and, you know, Barrow and Gortz and so on, not whole of it, but a lot of it, was, um, you know, the collapse of state socialism, um, the left being replaced by neoliberalism, and people moving maybe from a socialist position. So it may, you know, it's not necessarily simply we've got eco-socialist politics. That's part of maybe a wider tendency for the left to being collapsing. Um, certainly what I would say with Green Parties is the German Green Party was the most radical and eco-socialist party and is now very much in the centre of politics on the right. And I think part of that is the institutions in Germany, that what you have is systems of local government where people can participate. And what you had was the, the radical left in the German Greens had very much come out of the social movements. And you then got to a point where there wasn't a strategy to advance things to the next level, whereas the Rialos, it was very much, we can go into local government, national government, and so on. So I think there's that kind of thing that we get from Spinoza, that human beings don't have a kingdom within nature. We don't have absolute agency. We work within particular circumstances. And we work best, when we're trying to change things, of look at those kind of circumstances. And generally, I think, with the, the Greens experience, particularly on continental Europe, is you can then go into coalitions in France and Italy and Sweden and so on and so forth. And the danger with that is then that erodes your political radicalism, but then if you don't go into the coalition, maybe it's then difficult to move. I think the situation we now have is new radical parties and social movements, but actually constructing the alternatives is very, very difficult. And one of the things I'd say about the practical commons and cooperatives and workers' control, that we're in a society which is very paternalistic, top-down, very liberal, so the habits and practices of cooperation are ones that we have to renew and learn. They're not things which are automatically there. And the challenge for the left is, as there's a collapse of neoliberal institutions, can we actually come up with alternative institutions? And I don't think you can pose this as just a sort of abstract, formal level. The actual practices are going to be difficult to achieve. Um, in terms of the kind of policy impact, no, I haven't studied that. In terms of how Ostrom's used, and this fits in with the debate around public goods, the way you know, her work has been used, and in some ways this comes from her own spirit, is to say there's people like Samuelson who say there are public goods. These goods, for reasons I don't want to get into, technical free rider stuff, can only be supplied by the state. And then you have Buchanan and the Ostrom saying, well, actually, local communities can build a lighthouse yeah, community associations. So the way it's then mobilised is to say um, you don't actually need the state, you can shrink the state, yeah? And you can see lots of kind of approaches within Ostrom how it can be articulated to then promote neoliberalism. So you have a critique of the paternalism of the state and then people like Mrs Thatcher use that to roll back the state and then you have this strange thing where you have the Hayekian critique of planning and then Friedman flips that over and goes... Yeah, corporations, centralisation, brilliant. Um, so I think there's attempts to mobilise her work in certain ways. There's certainly strains in her work that goes with that. And there's counter ways of, of mobilising that. Um, I think broadly she had a tradition, but I think it's very open. And my, my small, small experience is I don't, you know, I do my Green Party stuff, I have a non-academic job. You know, I'm on the fringes of everything. I basically just sit and write my books like a hermit, and it's very rare I do anything like this. But um, my experiences with Ostrom scholars have been wonderful. You know, that it would be, we might come from a different perspective than you, but, you know, there's some things we can agree on. And I think there's very much a kind of pluralistic approach with Ostrom's work and very much a kind of idea of contention and argument. Um, you know, which I think is, is good. So I think there are different ways that it can, her work can be mobilised, but all the time it's, on the one hand, from the, from the left, we should think about structures and feminist critique and Marxist critique and so on, and all of that stuff the Ostroms didn't do, but there's also precisely what are we going to do in this context? You know, if you've occupied the factory, 
How do you work out who does what? How do you make it work? How long are the tea breaks? And the Ostrom technique is to say, there's a set of rules and institutions. Let's investigate this. Let's look at where it worked, where it failed. And, you know, I think if we're going to make a world that works, we really need that. So the, the, my kind of overall passion, when I always say people working academically with the Ostrom stuff, is, yeah, the commons is really important, but look at the academic practice of the Ostrium, or Ostroms, you know, radically democratic and cooperative, and how do we actually apply that concretely? So I have a question for Pat Devine. So first of all, welcome back. When you first came here, I think I was undergrad. Were we undergrad? Yeah. And I always appreciate your talk, so first of all. And the second thing is that while you were uh, speaking, I remember the piece. Sorry for the name dropping, but I'll try to explain myself. Uh, there was a 2006 piece by Mark Purcell. And he talks about the urban democracy and the localist trap. And when you uh, talked about the question of scale, and uh, the local scale and privileging, privileging the local scale, I immediately remembered this piece by Mark Purcell. And he, in this piece, sorry, I'm not fresh on this piece, so I tried to remember and put some notes. And he says that the local scale is not always key to democracy. And because some decisions go, all, you know, whenever there is a local participation and whenever there is a necessity to give a decision, some decisions go beyond the limits of the local. And actually, whenever we are thinking about the local, uh, even if we think that it's good because participation is actually coming from these people, even the local is ho not homogenous. You know, we are always losing some kind of the internal dynamics, internal power relations or institutional dynamics going on in there. So I wonder what do you think about this localist trap? Do you agree or not? And if you agree, actually, in this kind of naming, how will I know when I'm in the localist trap or not, when I'm working? Thank you. Hi, I, as I said yesterday, I'm a journalist. Um, and I'm from Bloomington, so I thought maybe I should say a few things. I told him when we were having coffee. Um, I find that Ostrom's work is very much reflective of Bloomington community. There are over 1,100 uh, nonprofit organizations. I am part of Center for Sustainable Living. We have the Eco Report, where I do the live production. We have Trash and Fashion, Discardia, Bicycle Work, Forest Alliance. It goes on and on and on. Um, so this individualism within the collective uh, it sort of relates to what you're saying, is ongoing experimentation all the time. Uh, the corporations are started and people have all the best intentions. Some of them are, you know, read a lot of theories. Uh, some of them are just hippies, <laughs> wannabes, activists. Some of them are retired scientists. Um, and there's always a problem at a certain point and one fails and then another starts. So it's an ongoing experimentation. And so I think very much that her own experiences is part of her work. Uh, what I want to ask is another person, I'm thinking that his experiences are uh, affecting his decisions now. So I want to bring the Pope <laughs> into the discussion. <laughs> Because one of his mentors was a woman who was very much championing the rights of the prisoners and prisoners' um, families, and she was a communist. And Pope makes a distinction between you know communism and what he's doing, but he also says that you know uh, communists stole Jesus's idea, <laughs> which <laughs> which I don't have a problem with, you know. Um, so now he's one of the most green people and most socialist person. So um, how do we utilize Pope? <laughs> and how do you utilize Pope? Okay, thank you. Uh, hello. Thank you very much. Uh, one of, um, let's say, the, the critiques that uh, eco-socialism makes and uh, where I think the echo enters in the socialism is the critique of uh, productivism and also of technology, of considering that technology is not uh, non-neutral, 
and also that it's not enough to change the relations of production, we sh should change the conditions of production and put all the questions, uh, what to produce, how to produce, for whom, considering the ecological uh, uh, question. And um, um, so I would like to hear a, a bit about this, uh, no, uh, because it's not only about um, self-governing and the radical democracy. We should move beyond the question of Soviets plus electricity. So this critique from uh, eco-socialism, I think it's uh, crucial. Um, uh, and uh, how to think uh, from the here and now, for instance, in the social ecologies, we want, um, for instance, uh, what to think about nu nuclear energy, GMOs, and so on, from an eco-socialist uh, perspective. Um, Another question um, related with the, the issue of um, democracy and the deliberation, de uh, etc. Um, somehow uh, Marx envi envisioned the end of politics with the socialism, uh, the end of political um, conflicts. And somehow, when I listened about uh, you know, the self-governing in the commons, it comes to me that uh, somehow this is connected with some form of negotiation and consensus politics. So I ask a bit, where is the, um, the politics in terms of conflict of allowing also different ty types of um, or political organization, for instance, uh, diversity of multi-partidarism, etc., to enter in this uh, eco-socialist uh, ways of um, multi-democracy, connecting direct democracy with the, the deliberative uh, representative democracy, um, etc. And also, uh, for finalizing, just the comments. Um, within the, the current uh, crisis of capitalism and uh, aggressiveness of uh, austerity, um, I got the feeling that uh, eco-socialism uh, has participated uh, not very much in this uh, debate. That in, it somehow the discussion becomes very abstract and uh, position in a level that doesn't connect uh, with the day-to-day -day politics that we are facing now. So what kind of contribution could uh, the eco-socialist project and politics uh, to engage more with uh, the movements, with these local initiatives, articulations that are needed for building the counter-hegemony, etc. So how eco-socialism can uh, be more um, practical, let's say, because I think other uh, currents like anarchists, autonomous Marxists, are more connected with this daily politics. And I think it would be interesting also to reflect how can eco-socialism move a bit beyond this um, macro level of reflection, theorizing, etc., to engage more in the day-to-day -day politics and change things. Thanks a lot, uh, Derek and Pat. Um, I, I mean, for me, it's a, another pleasure because I really um, enjoy your writings, Derek, on, on the green left. Uh, but I have kind of um, a concern on conflating the green movement with eco-socialism a bit too much, which I'm not necessary, which I don't necessarily think that they overlap that much. And in your writings, I see that actually there is. I mean, you tend to just bring them together. I was in this green European Green Parties meeting here in Istanbul a couple of months ago, and um, uh, that was extremely disappointing, I would say, uh, and had nothing to do with eco-socialism by, by any means. So the question I have for you is uh, on, so where do you position actually, I mean, following up from Rita's point, uh, the, the fourth international eco-socialist lobby and cobalt tradition of eco-socialism, uh, which has a distinct path, I would say, and how do you position like the, the whole politics that the green left within that. And for Pat, I have this very short question on, since you've mentioned the, the climate change as an example on, in terms of, uh, with the power debates of Holloway and so on and so forth, I'm reminded of the 
debates we had in, in Copenhagen in 2009 with the Climate Justice Action Group, uh, whether to halt and bring the um, COP15 um, by blockades and whatever, you know, what Naomi Klein would now call this blockade and so on and so forth. And there is this big debate whether we should be inside or outside of this process. I mean, there is this deliberative or international negotiation process, but many are actually now arguing that the power is, doesn't really help us inside or being inside and negotiating and trying to convince people, but uh, power may be actually on the outside of those conference centers by blocking and then uh, halting the whole process and then trying to show that uh, this may be done in a different manner rather than those air-conditioned rooms of uh, conference halls. Thank you. Okay, huge number of really interesting questions. Um, it's always like when I'm with my wife, it's like, don't get him onto religion, don't mention the Pope. So not religion, no, um, but I'll come back to that, that'll probably take about 10 hours. Um, I just love the Pope so much. Um, in terms of the, the Green Left, I mean, I basically view things as projects. So how do you promote eco-socialism? Um, that fits in with the practical stuff. So institutionally, I'm in, Green Part in the Green Party, in the Green Party of England and Wales, it's moved a long way to the left, although there are debates around that. Is that really eco-socialism? Is it more the failure of the Labour left? To what extent is this theorised? But clearly, at the moment, maybe temporary, the left are hegemonic. So you have the party which was the most conservative Green Party in Europe is now one of the most left. So the project is how do we do that within European Green Parties? There's no essentialism. We don't go, Green Parties are essentially this or that. It's how do we build eco-socialism? So I'm international coordinator of the Green Party and I'm very e eager to network and work on that. And certainly sometimes the European Green meetings can be rather formalist. But I would say there's a much more of a, I think there is a movement within the Greens. So for example, in Greece, the Greens are in Syria. In Spain, the New Greens have been supporting, you know, the, the, the New Left. Um, best of all, in Turkey, um, the Green and Left parties joined the HDP. So I'm saying to the Green Party of England and Wales, um, Turkish and Kurdish citizens, Turkish citizens can vote. What are we doing to support them? So it's a politics of constant, concrete intervention. Um, in terms of the genealogy and the beastery of the Green Left, um, it's been amazing that the Fourth International from Trotsky, who we might associate with very um, productivist and, and Leninist and old style, the Fourth International has declared itself eco-socialist, and that is a wonderful thing. And I think, in some ways, curiously, I get this mostrum that you have to have, in a sense, a Leninist politics, but also a pluralist politics, that some people will be eco-socialist in the Green Party, some people will do social movement stuff and decry political parties, and there is the kind of, that's licensed by the Ostrom stuff powerfully, because you experiment. There isn't one person who has the view that you follow. That was what was wrong with Leninism. And, you know, if you look at the Fourth International, particularly socialist resistance in the UK, who are a small group, they've done wonderful things. And we, between the Greens and social resistance and even more Leninist parties, um, we've done like a whole workers' climate campaign. The Trade Union Council have adopted a one million climate jobs. There's been mobilisation around factory workers in the Isle of Wight who were in the, in the making renewable energy wind turbines and the factories closed, and they occupied. And I um, you know, write for the Morning Star, which is associated with the Communist Party, and it wasn't the Euro-Communist Party, it was the more Communist Communist Party, but they've been very open to kind of debating green politics. So there are a variety of institutional structures, but it's always what do we do in this specific moment, what's coming up at the, the European Green Congress. And what I would say is we'll go, oh, the German Greens, they failed completely. I was fascinated at the last EGP council, there's two European Green Party councils a year. One of the great things was there was a by-election, so we elected somebody from the Greek Greens onto the committee, that was a victory for the left. And then to sit round with you know, people like Michael from the, the, the um, Federation of Young European Greens, 
And I was surprised to found that in the German Greens, oh, the German Greens are so right wing, there's apparently a left, they organise separate congresses. And I would say probably the most active force, if you actually look at it, for eco socialism in Europe, is men and women in their 20s and 30s who are German. And, you know, we wouldn't predict that. Um, but I think it's, it's something that we have to make. Making it practical, yeah, I think there was a time when it was an intellectual discourse and we'd read Rudolf Barrow. What we've actually seen is workers and peasants and left governments adopting eco-socialism. And if you want practical eco-socialism and you can, you, you read Spanish, Hugo Blanco, people know about Hugo Blanco. So Hugo Blanco was a historic leader of the Fourth International. The only Trotskyist praised by Che Guevara made a successful revolution in 1961 in Peru to defend peasants. He's, I think, now 80. He publishes Lucha Indigena, and he's an eminently practical eco-socialist. And certainly in his paper, Lucha Indigena, Indigenous Struggle, though that's looking at indigenous, and he coming from indigenous, and the, the indigenous as the backbone of eco-socialism in Latin America, it's engaging with the anti-austerity movements and so on. And he, incidentally, is a great fan of Ostrom. So I think that's a way of making it practical. I, you know, I'm a parish councillor, lowest level of local government. I'm a parish councillor in Ascot, most conservative party of Britain. Um, but one of the things that we've been doing is saying local pubs are being closed, and there's a piece of legislation where the community can then own the pubs and stop it being closed. And that's something that we've been doing since all the time. There's a danger of saying political movements are essentially this or that or the other. It's like, how do you actually intervene in the concrete? The Pope, of course, I, I just think is wonderful, mainly because of my interest in religion, and I always think I should repress this, you'll have to cut this from the film, but what I like best about the Pope is the theology, because I'm, you know, I'm very religious, and I'm kind of pursuing like a completely materialist and realist real personal religion based on Spinoza, and, you know, kind of when the Pope goes, God isn't a magician, it's like... Yes, the true religion of Spinoza. And, you know, just interesting with the Pope that there's no contradiction between science and nature. But I think probably if I said that I like the Pope most because of his theology, that would be very bad for the Pope. Um, and there are other reasons why we would see the Pope as being a good Spinozaist. But if you're a good Spinozaist, you don't say you're a good Spinozaist, or you get excommunicated even more quickly. And, of course, the great revolution, revelation was I've got very into Althazar, and, of course, when Althazar was talking about Marx, he meant Spinoza, but being in the French Communist Party, he could never actually say Spinoza. Um, so I think the, the... I mean, seriously, I think the Pope is interesting. I think what's great... There are certainly some huge... Air. We could say the Catholic Church has been a corrupt institution. I think we could condemn anything that the Pope says on sexuality. But in terms of capitalism, ecology, nature, and the idea of actual direct focused interventions... Um, you know, he's got that kind of realist politics that we get via Machiavelli and Spinoza and so on, where you have the most realist practical intervention to promote the common good. And I think, yes, we can connect that with Christianity. One of the things I would say is we can connect it with the Latin American left. So my wife will always say, look at Paulo Freire and the idea that liberation is about dialogue, which fits in with Ostrom. It's never about telling people what to do. Saw a quote from Fidel Castro in the 70s saying, one day there'll be a black American president and a Latin American pope. So, you know, in religious terms, you know, excuse me, I'm quite religious, I know other people wouldn't be. Um, Spinoza would say, how do you decide the orthodoxy of a text? How is a text the true text? How do we interpret the Bible? And basically he would say, um, you just read it, it's full of contradictions and problems, but what the Bible commands us to is obey God. God wants us to promote mutual love. So if the text has the effect of promoting mutual love, it's then orthodox. So I think with the Pope, you know, obviously some cautions about the origins and some things that we'd be very critical of, but I think in the true religion, his effects are very positive. Um. <clears throat> Right, well, um, in terms of the, uh, the, the local scale, I mean, of course, I, I agree uh, that that is a serious problem. Um, and um, you've got this, we've got this, this problem in the, in the UK at the moment, say, with respect to uh, wind turbines on land. There's a huge campaign against, um, because local people, um, for some reason or other, don't like them. 
near where they live for the most part. So there's always a problem of how, as it were, local autonomy fits into the wider picture. And how you know whether you're in that situation or not <laughs> is not an easy question to answer. I think it depends on the local circumstances. I have friends who um, started out by campaigning against uh, the proposal for a, for a wind turbine, uh, not actually in sight of them, the other side of a hill where they live, um, but it could be seen from a very famous walk in beautiful countryside. So they object to this on aesthetic grounds. Um, but what's happened is that because they've been so passionate about this, they've, they've looked around for all sorts of arguments against wind power and have now become, uh, through a process of uh, starting off with this local issue, uh, campaigners against wind power altogether. Uh, and adopting all sorts of what, as far as I can see, are completely spurious scientific reasons as to why they, they won't work. So it's not, it's not, an, easy, <laughs> not an easy question to deal with. Um, I think that um, the, uh, the inside-outside question is um, a very, very interesting one. Um, Jonathan Porritt, who was a, camp, you know, a very well-known a uh, green campaigner in the UK uh, for many years worked as an advisor to the petrol companies uh, on the grounds that he thought that they could uh, be greened. He recently resigned uh, on the grounds that he'd come to the conclusion they can't. Um, <laughs> so, um, and there is this more general argument that um, NGOs become co-opted effectively by being drawn into the um, decisions. And so, again, I think it's very difficult to make a generalisation about this. Uh, my own experience in uh, trade unionism in, in the university where I worked was um, that you really had to have um, a link between those who were in the inside and those who are campaigning and forming the uh, forces outside. And if that link is severed, then either you get pure um, oppositionalism, but you don't actually want to be involved in the decisions, you just oppose everything, or you are involved in the decisions but get co-opted. And, and therefore, unless you're constantly, while in the decision-making process, is under pressure from outside, uh, you've got a problem. But it's not an easy question to answer. I mean, I, co I completely agree on that. Um, the only other thing I'd, um, I'd, I'd just like to comment on was the, the question on um, uh, democracy and the end of politics uh, and, um, <laughs> and diversity. I mean, I've come to the conclusion that uh, the end of capitalism and eco-socialism doesn't mean the end of politics uh, because uh, it seems to me it, there are, are always going to be different views about the way forward and it's got to be some sort of political process uh, as to how you resolve those. And that's why I think the sort of deliberative democracy, negotiation, uh, participation in decision making, uh, in the course of which you come to realise uh, the point of view of people who take a different angle. But in the end, you've got to arrive at some workable thing that you're all prepared to go along with. And that, coming back to... Um, uh, Derek's comment on, um, on Albert and Harnell's book, a Participatory Planning or Paracon. I mean, I don't uh, have quite the vehement dislike of the book that, that you do. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but uh, and what I liked about it was the emphasis on participation. But what I uh, disagreed very strongly uh, about their model was two things. First of all, um, it is, for those of you familiar with it, it, it is actually a, a neoclassical general equilibrium model in which the um, individual um, is replaced by workers or community councils. And it's a process of aggregating preferences rather than engaging in dialogue in the course of which the preferences change. Um, uh, and therefore, in that sense, there's no politics in it. Uh, and that seems to me to be the problem with it. Um, but that's just, a, you know, by the by. I mean, we're not talking about <laughs> uh, 
that, that model. But I, but I think that um, the, the question of the fact that you know, there won't be a, an end of politics, there are bound to be continuing differences of view. I think that my own view would be that there need to be uh, multiple uh, political parties which offer different visions of the way forward. And I think this also links up with the issues you raised um, about uh, productionism, non-neutral technology, um, and that brings us to, you know, there'll be different views on that. How are they going to be resolved? And um, on the question, for example, the two questions you, specific questions you raised, nuclear power um, and GMOs, well, you know, there are very different views on that. I mean, George Monbiot, who's a significant spokesperson uh, on, uh, in the green sort of camp, uh, has come out in favour of nuclear power um, on the grounds that it's such an urgent problem and there isn't time to do anything else. Most, I think, of the, of the green movement wouldn't agree with that. I would be one of them. Um, but, you know, there are people who do take that view. And similarly, with GMOs, so these are not easy questions to answer. There's not going to be just a consensus. There's got to be, therefore, what you might call a political process in the course of which these things are thrashed out and decisions are made. I'll just take a last round of quick questions. Hi. Um, could you please expand a little bit more on the eco-socialist principles and um, how eco-socialism can seize destructive contradiction of human and external natural world and how eco-socialism would be restoring production relations alternative to current capital labor relation. Any other questions? Hi, thanks. And thanks for a really good discussion. It's hard to uh, I, I come from Canada. These uh, discussions in North America aren't as frequent as they are here in Europe, so it's been it's wonderful to have a session just talking about this. Um, and also for, uh, I'm from Lund University, now I'm based in Sweden, and I do a lot of climate change research. So um, having been uh, at some of the, uh, the negotiations, especially last June, I can tell you that the uh, uh, Bolivarian Republic of, of Venezuela is the only member who got up and said we are eco-socialists and and for those who believe that um, what is happening there is is a deliberative democracy it that's not um, what is happening <laughs> those negotiations so um, this is one of the reasons why it is so important for people to uh, to be on the street outside the uh, the venues as well as being able to talk about it um, with their politicians at home because they will tell you you know these are national governments negotiating um, and many of them are suffering from state capture so they need to be reminded who their their main shareholders are um, so stay engaged with your national governments on this as we go up to, to Paris, please. Um, so one of the things I wanted to uh, ask you about, also in, in the context of Ostrom, because it is true you get through some of her work, and if we're really just pulled into the common in, uh, commons discussions, it can be overwhelming looking at some of these branching models. And, and uh, if you're coming from this in more of an anthropological sense, in many ways, after you, you sit down and catch your breath from the, uh, the models, you realize that she is trying, uh, you know, the work that she was doing and her husband was doing in some ways was trying to codify social relations that predate um, industrialization and, and the enclosures. So you're, you're finding ways of trying to re-socialize and re-introduce uh, people to the practice of, of coming up with consensus and, and coming up with your own institutions and being uh, reinvigorated on that. Um, so I wanted to, um, one of the things I wanted to just sort of raise and, and ask about from that context is, is how you're seeing um, these uh, prospects for these micro practices, whether it's urban gardening and permaculture and some of these alternative threads, degrowthers, um, how you see that as an extension of, of uh, eco-socialism in practice, even if they aren't uh, self-identifying in that context, since it seems to be carrying on some of the the, pr the practices that seem to be embedded in eco-socialism. Um, and also, just looking at it in terms of um, 
uh, engaging with the localism, and I, I do uh, think that was very interesting, but falling into the localist trap is a challenge. So being critical geographers and, and uh, critical analysts of this, um, we do look to Bauman and the concerns about um, where you'd have social critique about xenophobia and the, the prospects of overprivileging certain aspects of local, especially if you haven't made explicit the power relations that are embedded in the, some of those local systems that are privileging certain local voices over others. So in terms of how we can confront that challenge of, of uh, recognizing and, and, and elevating the realm of the power relation in, in the local discourse so that um, as we engage with deliberative uh, democracy and more direct democracy, we actually have a fuller engagement of, of stakeholders and it isn't just an echo chamber of the same powerful interests kind of leading everybody. Um, in relationship to that, you know, just bringing together the Green Party movements, um, being in Sweden where, um, let's just say, uh, ecological modernization was uh, was more of the theoretical framework over eco-socialism. So uh, looking to the, the element of who you're serving and how you're producing and for whom and why seems to be pretty central if we're going to actually have a real discussion on this. So it'd be great to hear your reflections on that. Thank you. Um, I've got two questions and I hope to articulate them better than my last one. Um, my first one is in relation to um, this whole sort of market, uh, state market and the commons discourse with the, in this, and it's, is it a tripartite or is it um, the commons as a polycentric system of governance resource, uh, of, uh, uh, yeah, is that supposed to replace the dualistic model? Um, that would be my first question. The second one is, um, we talk about natural resources a lot of the time, and for me, um, the main question when we are scaling up is market mechanisms and especially finance in the sense of money um, that does have such a, a, an effect on, on, on the commons as well. And so how do we go about understanding the market as a commons? or finance in the sense of surplus value over accumulation. And is, is there any work done on that? Um, yeah. Um, well, that's provoked at least 27 thoughts, and I'll try to remember one or two of them. Um, I'm really glad there was a mention of Venezuela because what you have is ALBA, which is the solidarity trading bloc between Venezuela, Bolivia, Ecuador, Cuba. And, um, you know, Venezuela is kind of Satan. Um, you know, in, in Britain, we're very closely aligned with Saudi Arabia, and we praise them as being great for human rights as they chop people's heads off and say it's wrong for, for women to, to drive. And, of course, during the Cold War, there was a, a critique of human rights in the Soviet Union, which is completely correct. But then there's suddenly Venezuela is Satan. And certainly there are, there are problems with Venezuela. But I think the, you, know, you can't just say things are being attacked, therefore, that makes them good. And there are some big problems with Venezuela. But certainly you've had this block of countries, ironically, quite often very based on fossil fuels, who've actually got up and said, we're eco-socialists let's suppose reds, um, you know, let's not commodify nature. And even sometimes there's hypocrisy and failure to do that. That's so much better than the governments who are absolutely wedded to, to, to the ecologically wrong. And, you know, a lot of these kind of debates about Holloway and localism, they're in the context of Venezuela and Bolivia and Ecuador and of taking power. And a lot of things can go wrong with that. But there's also that's created space. Um, so I think that's very much part of eco-socialism, so that was one thought. Um, Canada, I was going to mention um, Ian Angus, who produces Climate and Capitalism, which is a really great resource, um, which you know gets onto a lot of the questions we're asked here about surplus capital and how capitalism works, and so on, is a really strong resource for kind of eco-socialist understanding. I haven't yet said anything about the local, and one of the things I was going to emphasise with Ostrom, though a lot of it was based on the local, yes, it's polycentric. Um, so yes, it's not ju yes, it is getting rid of the duality of the market and the state. And if you talk to people who are more Marxist like me or people who are more Austrian, 
all of the scholars who use Ostrom's work would say there isn't the market, just the market and the state. I mean, she did blatantly write her Nobel lecture as beyond markets and states. And, um, you know, there's a whole spectrum. So, for example, with property rights, it's not just private property, but usufruct, so people can actually you have access to property. And this, I think, gets onto the kind of eco-socialist production question that eco-socialism and Ostrom rejects the monopoly of the commodity, that if we're just producing things to buy and sell um, and promoting exchange values, that doesn't work. What we can actually have is to actually have something which is more sustainable because you give people access to resources without always having to privately own them. So, you know, simple thing, car sharing. Um, George Monbiot, yeah, nuclear power. What about free public transport? You know, that's maybe things have become so desperate we need that. So both from Ostrom and eco-socialism is getting beyond the commodity and it's actually finding ways that we can share resources because there's a logic with exchange values that you produce more, throw it away and so on and so forth. Whereas this basic idea that you have a commons in private goods and you 3D print goods and you rent more and some Austrian... People, Ostrom people might say you can do that within the market. But that, I think, is a key to ecological production. What we've also had is workers' plans. So workers actually say, famous example being Lucas Aerospace in the UK in the 80s, instead of producing weapons, what can we produce instead? So, you know, I think you can... There's some things which are the same in eco-socialism and kind of Ostrom thought... But, it, you know, how do you have this participation in planning so we get beyond simply the, the commodity? Localism, I didn't quite get into that and meant to, because though, as I said, a lot of her work was based on the local, she realised you needed to scale up, and she talked about social ecological systems and how, like, a local commons would then be in a wider geographical and social. So she certainly was aware of this. I think the, the target of... Pat's critique, and I agree with him very much on this, is not so much Ostrom, although we both have criticisms of some of the things that Ostrom did and so on, but really of people like Holloway and maybe Gibson Graham of saying, um, you don't need to go through the state. If you go through the state, you're immediately absorbed and co-opted. And actually, there's a great diversity of non-capitalist things happening anyway. And I think what we've learned is you do need to interact with state power because they set rules. So even on the localism, if you don't want a windmill, you don't get a windmill. If you don't want fracking, you put up with it. So in the UK, very top-down, very paternalistic, so the local is used to impose what the government wants because it fits in with the corporations. So, in, you know, and again, get for this from Ostrom, focus on rules and institutions. Rules and institutions, you know, self-governance and participation, but governments at the moment set them. So if you're not intervening and challenging those governments, they're going to keep changing the rules and institutions so that there's less and less democratic participation. And I would say well, another one of the things which is useful from the Ostroms is they had, with Pat talking about trade unions and um, UCU and so on, is they talk about institutional analysis and development. So they'd kind of write a chart looking at a particular power structure, who's got power, the moves they could make. So that kind of stuff can be quite good for intervening. Um, I don't know whether I've covered all of the kind of points, but um, maybe to kind of sum up some of my feelings. All the time I'm kind of trying to say, don't think about this in terms of just broad political theory and panaceas and slogans, but what precisely are we going to do within a particular context in the German, in the German Greens or the Fourth International or with our micro-garden that does fit in? And what, to me, you know, the great political ecologists were Marx and Ostrom, and what they're both doing is saying human beings are part of nature, like Spinoza said, true religion, like the Pope, um, you know, and our interaction with the rest of nature is mediated by institutions, and how do we intervene? So it's self-governing, um, and okay, Ostrom didn't believe in everything being commons, but she certainly believed in broader social ownership. Um, so what Ostrom's saying is, in particular institutions in a precise circumstance, what do we do? How do you get the commons to run? Marx would talk about wider structures. So perhaps an image I would give you, if you know um, England, um, 
There's a commons in Cricklade, which is a town in Wiltshire, where I come from, and there's a water meadow, which is very beautiful, very famous for its flowers, and it's been maintained as a commons since the 8th century. And this sums up the Marx and Ostrom perspectives, because what you had in Britain is commons, are quite owned, often by, owned by church, um, aristocracy, royal family. So there's a danger in which your commons just would be subsistence for the serfs, and you had a commons that was owned by the people, which gradually then had an overall ownership in a kind of feudal structure. So we always have to question the commons. But also what's great about it is there are all these kind of local officials and practices, and if people are abusing the commons, there's like the court leet. And that's come right from the ninth century. So in a sense, there's a danger of seeing commons as something ancient, or that a commons sometimes is something we just get in cyberspace. Commons, I think, potentially is universal, and you have much wider structures of property ownership. But we have to you know, look at the science of the structures that may erode and enclose the commons, and the kind of science of how do you manage the commons. But in their pursuit of science, both Ostrom and Marx would try to struggle against things which were elitist. But I think all the time we have to think as precisely and scientifically about what makes these wonderful things work. So maybe they are wonderful. So I'll, I'll stop there. Just like to make one comment on the uh, the question about um, market and, uh, and and state. Um, I think we've talked about the fact that um, d different scales, different levels. Uh, if you like, a society-wide institution, you can call it the state, if you like, is obviously needed. It sets the rules, as, as, as Derek had said. It also is probably the mechanism through which distribution, redistribution, where necessary, would take place. Um, so I think we've, we've discussed that. What I think we haven't perhaps discussed enough is the market, uh, because the market, uh, I think, needs to be deconstructed. I mean, there's, there's market exchange, um, and uh, you know many uh, models of socialism uh, would describe themselves as market socialist um, but there's also the operation of market forces um, and the operation of market forces uh, exists when um, the uh, inputs into the production process as Marx put it na namely um, land and labor have become commodities or, or as um, Polanyi puts it, where um, the land, labour, and he also says money, have become what he calls fictitious commodities, because they're treated as commodities and bought and sold, and they're the, the way in which resources are reallocated from one use to another through the operation of market forces in pursuit of profit. Now, I mean, if you want to get rid of capitalism, you have to get rid of the market in land, labour, uh, and money. Um, the question is, um, do you have to get rid of market exchange as well? Uh, personally, I don't think so, but many people do. Um, I think the problem with market socialists who don't want to get rid of the market by definition, but they also maintain market forces as the allocating mechanism for the redistribution of resources, whereas uh, in the a participatory planning model, you would have those decisions about how resources are allocated made through a democratic, participatory, deliberative process. Uh, but market exchange is something that could well be seen as continuing as a way of facilitating uh, the fact that people aren't going to be involved in a purely subsistence um, economy. So. I just thought it was worth making that clarification. We must be careful when we use the term market to be clear what we're talking about. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody, for a lively discussion. So I think it's now time for lunch, but I want to have you maybe announce what's going to happen after. Uh, so with Emily, we just thought maybe we could have the closing uh, together while we have lunch and sit on the grass and uh, have this like uh, uh, close circle and just discuss a bit and uh, then uh, say the final words and goodbye. <laughs>
what's the specific thing you're going to do in a particular precise context. And I think what's exciting with Rojava is what you've had with the Kurds and their allies um, is people saying we were nationalists, now we believe in self-government, um, we were Marxist-Leninists, now we're adopting the ideas of the, the green anarchist um, Murray Bookchin. Um, so on paper, it's kind of ecology, feminism, self-government, secularism, um, and the practice of that, of course, is going to be very, very difficult, reflects, of course, in some ways, the situation with oil, with the Latin American left, that you have people who proclaim eco-socialism, but their economies um, are based on oil. So we can sort of shout hypocrisy, but what I would shout is um, David Cameron and George Osborne in my country who want more and more oil and more and more fracking and more and more destruction. So the practices obviously won't live up to ecotopia, but the very fact that you've got a situation where people want to introduce self-government, want to wrestle with problems of conflict and how you deal with diverse communities, um, who at least aspire to be ecological, that is the core of what the Ostroms were talking about. And these kind of problems of self-governance, and the, you've got a society where there's been conflicts and sectarianism, and that conflict is going on, and people have been very repressed, and how you actually create self-governing democratic solutions is absolutely at the heart of the Ostroms' work. So that's why it's important. You know, and what I would say is they were coming out of the tradition of kind of city-states, radical republicanism, looking at how that influenced the American Revolution and, and so on. Now, I think I've forgotten most of the other questions, but what clearly came out with the question about um, people have to act in the short term, um, people may be very desperate, they can't think about the next seven generations. I think this reflects both weaknesses and strengths in what the Ostroms were doing, um, so what they didn't have was an understanding of class and macrostructures and so on, you know, because their references were coming from Austrians, they were practising the stuff in the Cold War, they were from a generation, the previous generation were people like Buchanan who were disillusioned. Okay, we'll uh, close again the question and answer discussion session. So, um, first maybe we could um, just ask um, if there are points of clarification and, and questions and then this will also lead to the discussion uh, that we will have. So maybe if you want, I mean those at the back, if you prefer to come to the front, it might ease the um, mic uh, process. Um, but if not, of course you can hide at the back. <laughs> so questions, comments, thoughts? Hey, thanks. So that was uh, very interesting, really useful to have uh, such an appreciative uh, and uh, critical, thoughtful uh, uh, comment on, on Ostrom and her work and the transformative possibilities of it. One of the thoughts I had, so, so you mentioned the, the connection with Rojava, and, and we had this very stimulating presentation earlier this week by uh, folks from Rojava. Um, but it, one of the things that it seemed to me was still unsettled from that talk was the uh, ecological and economic aspects of it. So as an example of the commons or eco-socialism, uh, that's a bit unclear to me as a connection, particularly because they're still dependent and, and for reasons that are you know, very understandable on exploiting non-renewable resources, particularly oil. Um, and so uh, I don't I don't quite see the connection there, uh, and I'm not sure. Uh, maybe maybe there's something I'm missing. So yeah. Uh, thank you, Derek. That was a wonderful talk. Um, just two quick questions. One that uh, do you see the Ostrom's rules for governing the commons being applicable to other property forms? And the second question is more of a comment, really, that um, one of the things that I think is often missing in, the, in their work is an appreciation of the intensity of desperation, that you may have the best rules in the world, but if people are literally surviving from day to day and have to just you know, cut the ground from under their feet, 
they don't have the luxury of thinking about the next generation, let alone the seventh. Sometimes we feel, uh, I, f I have the feeling that we're talking about what, we're trying to answer the what questions, and, some, and we forget the how question. And this is my, my question, actually. How we're going to have uh, a social responsibility, or let's say a social ownership of power, and how the common structure or the common framework deals with this question of, uh, of power. a round of answers or comments back. Derek. Okay, I'm trying to remember all this. Um, starting off with Rajava, um, I think with kind of the Ostrom's work, if you're thinking how does this fit in with the history of political philosophy, that probably in some ways never works. And though there are problems with what how they approached power, one of the things which is good about how they approached power was they wouldn't talk about general debates. They talk about things which are very specific. And I think there's a problem with us as academics um, coming up with theory, debating alternatives. But what's the point at which this actually engages with things which are on the ground? So in terms of my political practice in the Green Party, which is slightly separate from my kind of Austrian practice, as international coordinator of the Green Party, I'm trying to think, what are the most important things going on in terms of green politics? How can we support them as effectively as possible? And I think this is why Rajava is very, very important. Um, I, I stood as an election candidate in the British election in Windsor, where the Queen lives, got 3% of the vote. Um, and I was sponsored by um, the People's Democratic Union, who are the main political party in Rojava. Um, you know, and I've had this kind of connection in the Green Party. We sent out an election observer um, to the election a couple of weeks ago, who was involved, who witnessed the bomb attack, and was, you know, Sean, who's our election observer, was unhurt but saw people killed. And I, I think one of the things I do get in terms of politics and the Ostroms is when Frank Knight, people who are disillusioned Marxists who then became Austrians. So, you know, anything where you're talking about capitalism, class Marxism, those structures, there's obvious reasons why they wouldn't be theorising at that level. And unless we theorise at that level, there are problems because we're not, you know, individually free to get together and do these things. We're within particular structures. I think the closest they came to it was saying um, if people have a commons, they then have a material interest in maintaining the commons because if they don't maintain the commons, they're then in poverty. So that was what they would emphasise. Um, and, but the nearest, really, they got to kind of conceptualising capitalism was to say, oh, you might have a roving bandit economy. And this would be the idea that um, you know, fishing fleet from Japan or wherever would come in, and that way they just suck up all the fish and destroy the commons. So, what's good about their politics is it's like this very local, institutional, maybe problems with the local, but very specific. So, in what you do in that situation, and in any situation, you have to think about rules, but they maybe fail to, to look at the macro, um, and I think we can critique them, but equally, no thinker does everything. Um, in terms of um, the financial crisis and the states and all of these kind of things, you know, the, the, the state and the market are not kind of separate entities. They work together. The state sets up institutional rules that um, support the market. Um, Neoliberal economics, um, you know, failed utterly. And people talked about zombie economics. But rather than having the empowerment, what we've had is more neoliberal economics, because what the neoliberals do is use the crisis to entrench their power. So in Britain, we've got the least resilient economy in Europe, based on banking, um, and that puts at a great risk. But the crisis has increased government debt, so then that's used as an excuse to marketise more and corporatise, and so on and so forth. And we have to look at ways to intervene, which I think are very, very difficult in the UK, but certainly what we've seen, and again, probably difficult everywhere, but what you have in 
Turkey is the HDP, Syriza in Greece, parties in... One, when people plant fast-growing trees because they give rewards, returns immediately, rather than, say, on this campus where trees have been planted by people who have the luxury of thinking about the future. So um, to the extent that local communities with the you know, best intentions and will in the world can't actually escape certain situations which make them think in short terms, which are, you know, which have adverse effects on the commons, it takes us right back to, I think, what Pat was saying, that we have to think of the larger structures of structural conditions, the state, the market within which the commons are embedded. So uh, if you can just talk a little bit more about how the Ostroms uh, confronted that question, because I'm sure it came up lots of times um, in, in critiques of their work. Uh, thank you to both of you. It was a very interesting uh, discussion. So I have uh, two questions. One has to do, I will do a short comment if possible. Okay. Um, one has to do with the question of the state. Because uh, especially Derek, you mentioned, uh, and it's obvious in the Commons work and also also uh, this beyond market and state. But I'm wondering that uh, during the the capitalist crisis and during this specific crisis, I have the feeling that we have a, a phase of empowerment of the state. The the state is still very powerful. And uh, we can see that, for example, uh, with the way that is dealing with the debt crisis within Europe. So uh, I'm wondering how, let's say, the Commons approach and the eco-socialist approach deals with this question, with the critique to the state, not only uh, uh, with the new power of the state. And the second question related to the first one, um, Stavros, uh, last Tuesday, that he also talked uh, a bit about Commons, he said something that uh, what is important about the commons is not only uh, the social ownership that uh, Pat uh, mentioned, but also um, a social ownership of power, if I can use this uh, frame, this framework. Uh, and this is, 